Welcome to episode 26 of the Business Development Podcast. We have a very exciting episode for you guys today. We are interviewing local C of Aero Robotic Systems, Fahim Khan, and we are chatting robotics, AI, and what that means for your future. Stay tuned. The great Mark Cuban once said, business happens over years and years. Value is measured in the total upside of a business relationship not by how much you squeezed out in any one deal. And we couldn't agree more. This is the Business Development Podcast, based in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and broadcasting to the world. You'll get expert business development advice, tips and experiences, and you'll hear interviews with business owners, CEOs, and business development reps. You'll get actionable advice on how to grow business. Brought to you by Capital Business Development. Capital, let's do it. Welcome to the Business Development Podcast. And now your expert host, Lee Kennedy. Hello, welcome to the Business Development Podcast, episode 26. And today we have an amazing guest interview, a super cool one. I think you guys are all going to really like this one. Fahim Khan of Aero Robotic Systems. Fahim holds an MBA as well as a PhD in electrical engineering. He has utilized those skills leading a technical team behind the complex technology of multitasking robots that is now develop developing Aero Robotic Systems. For the last 15 years, Fahim has been involved in industrial automation in various capacities. He is also a founder of a biotech company, which is providing technology to global clients in the space of analytical instrumentation. Currently, Fahim is busy leading a team developing robotic systems to meet both future and current industry demand. Fahim, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on today. How are you? Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Kerry. It's just great to be on your show. And I'm that lucky number 26, which is, <laughs> which is going to make a difference. So, uh, yeah, very, very good to be here. Oh, show. it's so, oh, it's so good to have you, man. It's so good to have you. So just for the rest yeah. of the people who, who, who aren't sure why I have this particular one. So I was actually at a really cool event recently called the 500 Global Alberta Accelerator. And it was really highlighting new companies, mostly for investment. But one of the companies that came up was Aero Robotic Systems. And Fahim, you had a presentation there that was amazing, by the way. I absolutely loved it. I loved a few things about your presentation. You first off had the coolest presentation there. No question. <laughs> Robotics cool. is you. so cool. And maybe that's just because I'm a gigantic nerd and I grew up in the 2000s and just love robo yeah. robots in general and AI and stuff. I just think, I think it's such a neat... I think what's neat about robotics and AI is that it almost feels like magic. To most yeah, people who yeah, don't understand sure. it, it looks like magic. It's, it's crazy how it, how it works. Yeah, yeah. No, at the end of my presentation, I did say robots are coming. And you know, that I did say to my deep depth of my heart, actually. <laughs> and it is it is an exciting time. You know, when I give this analogy to people, then I generally talk about 60s, 70s, when people were thinking about, should we buy a computer or not? Is computers going to throw away some of the manual work, you know, typing on, the, on a typewriter or, you know, doing some calculations? And that was a time when people were thinking, oh, I think computers is going to make a difference. And then after five years, 10 years, huge companies like Microsoft, Dell, HP, they were born. Then they produced even more companies and a huge trillion dollar industry was born. So that's this is an exciting time with robotics and AI now. It, it, it totally is. And I completely agree yeah. with you. And I think it's the same now as it was then. We can't even see the future of what robotics and AI looks like yet. It's like if you were to look at the first computers that took up an entire room and thought, oh, yeah, no, one day those things will fit in our pocket and do 100 times yeah. more things, we couldn't have remotely imagined it. Exactly. And I think AI and robotics is kind of the same. It's like right now we're looking at these superficial things that they can do, but we haven't even remotely seen the full scope of what they are going to do. Yeah, yeah, that's true, Kelly. You gave the example of those huge mainframes where even just the bigger organizations, they could only afford those with a lot of maintenance and overheads for, for those. And then the new industry came through. And similarly, we are just, that's where we are feeling now that currently industry, the, the, uh, a small business, small to medium business, they need to buy multiple robots for various tasks just to automate those, just to overcome labor shortages for, you know, repetitive manual tasks where we are coming in that just like a small computer now, they just need to buy just one robot, which is multitasking. So they imagine you need to buy 
one laptop, one for browsing, another for videos, another one for gaming, another one for this kind of studio talks. It's not going to make sense, right? So the same is the case with the robotics. So when, when a business needs to buy multiple robots for various different tasks, this literally just move away from this, this imagination, this whole concept. And this is where we are coming in just to make it even more exciting for the industry. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, we'll get into this, but your your robots are really cool, too. I, I spent some time today even just on your website watching the watching yeah. the demonstration videos. And I definitely want to talk to you about the capabilities and stuff later on. But definitely. I think I want to start this podcast off today just by going a little bit into your background. You have a pretty impressive background. You hold a PhD. You hold an M, which is actually kind of a weird mix of, of education. <laughs> Yeah. And you've had a really, really interesting, you actually, you're a serial entrepreneur. This isn't your first business. And right. you've had a biotech company. Can you tell us a little bit about, about yourself? Yeah, yeah, wonderful. I would, I would love to. Let me, let me take you to 30 years back, because just you touched on the background. 30 years back, if you just think about a little bit of my history, I was a goat herder. I was, I was born in a, in a very poor village of Pakistan. I have been, my, my cousins are unfortunately still goat herders. So um, there was no concept of education over there and, you know, uh, no, no permanent source of water or even to, not enough wood to put fire. Wow. And no way to think of electricity. So from there, fast forward, I managed to move from one country to another country to another country. And then I went to Sweden, for example, to got master's in, in in semiconductors and uh, micro technology because i was super ambitious since my childhood i just wanted to get over with things wow. so um, i got bachelor's in electrical engineering i got master's in, in electrical engineering as well more specialization in making micro and then i got a phd also making microchips and then i moved to canada in 2013 so that i could basically do some cutting edge research at the university of alberta which i did for like five six years and then still I stayed really ambitious that I wanted to start. I wanted to convert that research into something where people could get some some useful technology, useful solutions. So I started a company in 2016 called Furian. We started making microchips for various industries, various clients. We, we, we are currently selling them globally. And... This was the time in, in 2018 when I thought, oh, I think I have some limited knowledge on how to run a business, how to, you know, think more in a way that how to make statements, how to, how to basically manage a team, how to become a great leader. So then I thought, OK, let's put some, some, some time into getting an MBA. Wow. Luckily, I, I managed to enter the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, a really a wonderful university. I got a, a great amount of knowledge over there and I finished my MBA within two years, which is a standard time. However, sometimes people do get late when they're running a company as well. And then I had to travel a lot. Sure. And so, you might yeah. have been a little busy. <laughs> <laughs> that was keeping me super busy and stuck with, you know, going back to the university after many years. And then also keeping taking care of the, the, the company and developing new products and talking to the clients. So, but, you know, I think it was just my nature of being ambitious and being, you know, just achieving something. So that because, I, as I told you, that I was a goat herder, no, no concept of education. And now I was collecting a lot of degrees in my pocket actually absolutely so, so um, and then from there when covid hit in 2020 when we were running very successfully and covid came and we started feeling that humans started getting afraid of each other <laughs> businesses were being impacted just because someone shows up with infection and then it just spread it throughout the plant and then I think there was an incident in Alberta when a meat plant got a huge yes. infection. And then just because someone just came with the, with that, and then they got and similarly this this whole phenomenon spread it. And this is where we thought, oh man, this is this this is not going to help people. And then we a hospital in, in one of the hospitals in Ontario they bought a robot for one hundred and twenty four thousand dollars, just one robot to disinfect the the surfaces and we yeah. then we contacted them and we thought okay this is this is great you you did you, you're going to take care of your patients by you know roboticizing your facility but how about because there's so much else in your hospital which you want to automate like you know cleaning a floor and other things and they said no they don't have enough budget now so this is where you know we, it, it struck us that this is a real pain of smaller medium-sized businesses yes and we, we went through so many other companies and then we got their feedback so you know this is a, a long story short <laughs> so sorry there are a lot of exciting updates but what i'm telling you is that i think it was just my nature of being ambitiousness not ambitious basically that was what it was driving throughout the creation of companies and me, me moving forward from there well 
first off, let me just congratulate you on your success because you. you are an incredibly impressive person and I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. You really <laughs> are. That is, it is unbelievable. There are people, you know, that come from completely different backgrounds that you, than you that basically, you know, say, well, you know, I don't have the ability or I, or I wasn't, there was no opportunity for me. And then someone like you shows up and is like, no, <laughs> watch me. Sure. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> well, and it's, it's so inspiring. It's so inspiring, yeah. Fahim. I find you incredibly inspiring. And not to mention, like, you know, you talk about your ambition, but your enthusiasm is what hooked me. When, yeah. you know, obviously you guys weren't in the room. I was in the room when Fahim was giving his presentation at the Global mm -hmm. 500 event. And it was amazing. Your ambition and the way that you really just got the room just going it was oh, yeah. unbelievable and uh, yeah just let me say I, I am very impressed by you Fahim and congratulations okay. on your success I know that that didn't just hand itself to you it took a lot of hard work and determination to get to where you're at and um, congratulations definitely thank you Kerry and yeah so you know well I'm so much thankful to Albertans to Canadians who built this 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 great and successful nation before me and then I came on and then you know I contributed to the to the society However, I'm always thankful to the people who are around me who are providing huge amount of support without any incentive. They, they are just basically passionate to push me, to push my goal, my objective, objectives forward. And so I'm always thankful to the people around me. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. You know what? I, you know, when I think about that a lot as well, the reality is some of the best help that I've ever gotten, Fahim, in my, in my own business ventures has literally been for free, has literally just yeah. been for people that, that wanted to help me. And I find that it typically comes from other business owners, right? Like I find a exactly. lot of my support as a business owner comes from other business owners. You're like, oh, yes. you know what, Kelly? Uh, yeah, do you want to go have lunch and just kind of pick my brain and I'll, I'll help you the way that I can? And I think, okay. I don't know whether that's a Canadian thing or just, you know, I just find that like a lot of business owners and a lot of people are willing to help you if you're just willing to ask. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, ask, you know, asking has got a huge power in it. And all of those us business owners, we have very similar pains and gains. So, so this, 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 this scenario of working together and especially post COVID, many things have changed actually. So we, we got, we got closer to each other. We, we work closely. So yeah. So businesses are helping businesses. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to, I want to touch a little bit into was Forian your your first business or did you have a business before then, Fahim? No, unfortunately not. Not the first one. I did fail with another one where I wanted to create a, a social network for students to, to share their data because students produce a huge amount of data every day. So I just wanted to cover that. I, I named that every role so that people can basically showcase their every role. For example, if you are a driver, then after some time you are a parent, then after some time you are a mm -hmm. cook, and then you are, a, you are a, you know, a podcast. You know, so I just wearing a few hats. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so I just wanted to provide some sort of a platform to people so that they can, you know, go online and then they can, they can feel, they can find themselves to be proud of their roles. However, uh, that, that whole venture did not go very well. I learned a lot. I failed. Uh, but failure is never a failure. It is, it brings a lot of huge benefits of being successful in the future. True. Um, it was a financial failure. It was uh, a little bit stressful. However, I did learn a huge amount of knowledge and I uh, made a lot of connections. I worked with so many people here in Edmonton. And then I, when I started my next company, I already knew what not to do. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, so my background, Fahim, I, I, I actually started in the oil and gas industry here in 2013. So kind of when you right. came, I, I was just yeah. getting my feet wet right. in, in the sales and business development role, which is really where this right. podcast is kind of accumulated. But, um, back then, that was kind of right, right at the peak of the oil boom in Alberta, right? Things were really yeah. kind of hitting their height at 2030, yeah. right before a gigantic crash. But, exactly. but yeah, I, I cut my teeth at that time, too. And uh, yeah, I, I guess what I'm getting at here is at that time, there was just so much going on, so much opportunity. And, and Alberta really hasn't changed in that front. It's, yeah. we, we, we definitely got, got hit. Like we, we got hurt in that 2015 downturn. But yeah. I would say, you know, right, I don't know. I don't even know if I would say if it was like COVID or right after, but I would say that like probably around 2022, it was like a light switch flipped. And I would say that we're right at the beginning. I know there's a lot of people talking like, that aren't being very optimistic right now. But I, I don't think so. I think Alberta, I think we're right kind of in the beginning of a new boom. 
Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, as you said, Alberta used to be an economic engine, and then a downfall came, and then people switched their careers, and they found some new ideas, and even they were in the conventional oil and gas industry or natural resources industry. But, you know, those people, they just came back with a lot more power, with a lot more skills and creativity, and then they started new businesses, they started new ideas, they took risks on something. I mean, there was a time when in, in 2015, 2014, there was a time when I was thinking, I think I should leave Alberta. I think it is so mm-hmm. much focused on oil, and, and so there's not much for me over here to gain. And But then I stayed here. I, I, I learned so much from the surroundings, from the society. And Alberta is coming back with a, with a big strike now because we are learning so much from other successful places. For example, California is a huge place, a great example for technology success. And because I'm in the tech space and I'm, I have a, I have a great circle who, who are investing, who are creating new companies. So with that perspective, I can easily say that Alberta is making a big way back and we are going to supply our solutions, our technologies, not just to Albertans, but throughout the world, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, you know, the technology that you guys are working on, and we'll definitely get into this later on in the show, but the technology that you guys are working on isn't limited to anything, really. Like some of the platforms that you're working on can be utilized in so many different industries, not, you know, that not only as well as oil and gas, I should say, as well as oil and gas, but literally everything from food processing to warehousing to you name it. I mean, it's, it's very impressive technology. Yeah. Well, robots are definitely there. I mean, it's, it's a natural need for us. There are certain tasks and companies, businesses where people do not find themselves to be proud of. Like if if you ask them, hey, can you mop this floor every day? Sure. Or can you take hazardous chemicals to spray on, on certain objects? So there are so many tasks where people need to automate them so that they are they are less prone to the to the labor shortages, to employee shortages, especially I mean, because you know humans have been made out of millions of years of evolution and we are really really creative and we should be more into creative work rather you know keep doing one repetitive task every day again and again and again so we can use our brain in a much better way than you know just asking someone hey your job is just to push this card 100 times a day Mm -hmm. your job is to 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 clamp to tighten this nut this mold this bolt multiple times a day so that's not what we are made for and humans start getting bored and they start getting, they start bringing in more hazardous situation when they are more into a task which they are not enjoying and which they are not um, being productive of. So they can stick around for some time because people need a check at the end of the day. But, you know, these new technologies, not just ours, but a lot of different software being, they're being developed, various sensors are being developed in Alberta, but generally, especially, but generally throughout Canada. And so I would, I'm really very much optimistic of of our future. Yeah, Canada. for sure. Well, one of the things that I kind of want to talk to you about is when people think of Canada, they're not thinking of tech, you know, like, <laughs> and I yeah. know that that's, that's kind of silly. Like we're, we're Canadian, right? Like we're, we're always yeah. trying to be optimistic, but like, I feel like when the world is thinking about technology, they always, they're thinking of Silicon Valley, right? They're, yeah. they're not looking at Alberta, but Alberta is really a, we're, we're a leader in some tech, aren't we? Exactly. Yeah, there are actually there are. I mean, Canada does have a huge leadership in certain areas overall. However, sometimes I do put some certain level of blame to the to the politicians. Sometimes they have been really too conventional. They did not think out of the box at a certain time. Imagine the level of investments and interest and, and traction we are getting in technology development here in Alberta now. Had this been 10 years, 15 years back, we would have made a, a big difference. We would be exporting a lot of technologies out of Alberta now. We are still doing but it is not much and so Canada overall I mean some of the economies are based on natural resources however for example if I give you this this one example that Canada is a leader has a leadership in robotics technologies for space for example China um, yeah this 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 helping the whole world you know by maintaining the the international space station and uh, similarly there are various other technologies where canada does have a leadership maple syrup you know yeah <laughs> another, <laughs> another another great product um oilers another great product and yeah. you know they're doing so, pretty okay uh, this year <laughs> <laughs> yeah so they should keep doing but they, they should they should introduce new technologies to the to the players so that those, those players can literally build uh, a good level of intelligence about uh, how, how their bodies look like, what, how they work on. So there are a lot of, uh, you know, advanced technologies uh, which can analyze 
various different gestures of players and how they work and how they how they can perform better so but you know i am i am literally highly optimistic on how we're going to perform in very near future so one of the questions that i have for you is i i think <clears throat> we kind of touched on this at the beginning of the show is that we know that robotics and ai and stuff is going to change everything but i feel like there's still a bit of a Mm, a reluctance, I want to call it a reluctance to make that change. What if what has been your experience? You know, obviously, you've kind of been hitting the road, you're looking for investment, you actually already have robots. Have you had any sales yet? Yeah, we are selling those. And I would agree with you, there was, uh, well, there is not much reluctance now. There used to be at some level, people were reluctant, you know, five, 10 years back. Okay. However, post-COVID, people have realized that they have to embrace the new technologies, the new tools, the new solutions, and they cannot stay conventional throughout the time, actually. Yeah. And what we are learning from small to medium-sized enterprises is that they do want to move on. They want to keep running their operations. They do want to keep their doors open. And if someone does not, if, if, if for example, if there is a certain employee and if they are responsible to run a certain task and if they don't show up, this, the business still needs to keep running. So they cannot ask another five employees who are dependent on that specific task that, oh, this guy didn't show up, so you also take it easy today. So, you know, AI, robotics, those are the, the, the fields which are being talked about a lot now. However, five years from now, we'll, we'll find out that, oh, this was basically a great addition to this, to the society. And it's not just robots for industrial use. You know, there are separate companies, separate industry booming up just to develop humanoid robots so that they can come to your home. They can work as your assistants, put dishes in the machine. They can, you know, do dishes probably. They can load some of your laundry. Wow. So, so you know, they, they, these things are on the way. And <laughs> like in, in our case, robots are, I mean, we are getting quite a bit of traction from the industry. Oh, man. I want to touch on that for a second again, because that's something I haven't even thought about that. When I think of robots, Fahim, I'm thinking of, yeah, I'm thinking of industrial application. I'm thinking of like car manufacturing. I never even once took a minute to think about one in my house. You know, I get, we, all, like, we have a Google and we have an Alexa, like we use Alexa in our house and the Kennedy household is full of Alexa. We love them, but like, you know, it doesn't do any work. It just provides entertainment, right? Are like, do you really think we're that close? How far are we away from having robots in our house? Well, you know, not very far. I mean, industry is moving to that horizon very quickly. And there are certain limitations. For example, those robots are very slow. The robotic arms, if we talk about a little bit about technology over here, their, their arms, their hands, they're a little bit slow. They're fragile, but they are picking up. And many people approached us, actually, because they don't want to develop legs for the robot. They just don't want to lengthen the time to market. So they want to put their upper torso of the robot on our platforms, on our autonomous platforms. So, you know, I would say probably five to eight years, so those robots will start showing up. Wow. Companies are companies are already on the way. The industry is basically doing quite good. And I mean, Roombas are already there. You know, Roombas are true. tiny Roombas. True. Are, uh, they are, they are uh, cleaning your floor. However, I forgot Roombas about are, I have a Roomba and I totally missed that. <laughs> exactly. So you, you missed it because Roombas are working in the background and they're, they're, they're yeah. not, I mean, they're doing just one task, you know. So yeah. imagine imagine a robot can 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 you know, once you come to your to your, to your house then you find out oh, everything is in place everything is ordered the robot took care of that there's no chance for a robot to get sick in the winter you know when everyone is sick all around True. so <laughs> yeah. so, <laughs> so those things are coming and AI is just like anything AI does have relatively less pleasant usages but I I think that if we use it the right way we're gonna get a good extract out of AI and robotics. Yeah, I think, okay, so I think I, I want to get, you know, you're an expert in this. We AI is being thrown around like crazy, right? We're utilizing yeah. it, you know, I mean, I, we're utilizing it at Capital in my business to, to help right. us create content for social media, that sort of thing. I'm seeing the uses, right? Like I've played, I've played with, what is it called? Oh, goodness, chat, chat GPT. Right. I have played with chat GPT and just kind of asked it to help me out with a few things. It's pretty <laughs> neat. But like, Tell me, what is AI really? What you know, you're the expert in this. What really yes. is it? I think as a consumer, as an individual who's not tech savvy in that way that understands how it's created, yeah. what is it really? Is it something that we should be afraid of or is it something that we should embrace? 
you yeah, well you know historically if we if you look in the back we have been afraid of so many different technologies and finally we found out that no this was really something great we sure. we, uh, we we really needed it and ai is a huge field it is not just one single piece of technology it is a combination of so many different fields which came together after a long time when they were working separately when people were developing cpus and then it became gpus they were gpus were mainly being used for gaming and then yep. when they came to a level when they became more affordable and come companies installed, deployed millions of those GPUs in their facilities to, to process complex algorithms. And then we got a lot of storage, we got a lot of processing power, we got very sharp software, especially software technologies, the, the, the backend technologies. And so when all of these came together, humans found out that now they can analyze huge amount of existing data, whether the data was in the form of text or images or sound or some other ways. So when they analyzed that data, then basically there was a natural outcome of that process that now you learned quite a lot from that data. Now you can basically do prediction for the future. Mm. For example, if, if, if you bring a new employee to your, to your new facility, you need to have them a tour on the first day so that they can collect data in their brain. They can sure. see, they can smell, they can hear. They can, they can build a, a basically a certain vision of the facility. And now they have collected the data. Now you can basically give them a certain task based on the, 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 the input you have already provided them. And you expect that there would be a certain outcome of that process. Same is the case with, with automation, with the automating a software so that they can learn from the data. And now they can, they can give us an output. And as you mentioned, content writing, for example, that content writing is not just happening just you know out of the blue. Chat learned and has been and is learning on the, the, the previous knowledge which humans created, actually. And that knowledge is spread all across the internet. And in the form of the books, in the form of the blogs, those those software, those algorithms, they, they basically scanned that huge amount of knowledge which we have already created. And now mm -hmm. they are basically utilizing that to produce new knowledge. Within that, there are always certain hiccups. There are always certain ways where, where a technology does not perform very well. And we start thinking that, no, this is taking over our own power, this is basically going to hurt us at some point, but I would say, no, that's not the case. Of course, there, there has to be certain care. It is just like, you know, if a knife is sitting in your kitchen, you can either use them for a useful purpose to chop your vegetables, or you can basically use it for for some, some bad purposes. Yes. So so it's a it's very similar way. This is a, it's an analogy which I give to my my kids, my wife, that there is new technology, but you know, so so we gotta be careful how we're gonna use it. Oh man, yeah, like you know, I'm a I'm a kid. I was born in the '80s, grew up in the '90s, uh, right? I watched Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah, Terminator. So you already witnessed it. So you already uh, Terminator, whether this was in the form of the books or movies, but then there was a time when when you know the the creative minds put a vision that these things do come. They need to be coming. Yeah, totally. I, yeah, you know, I mean, I feel like for you, because you've worked in the industry, you've seen it evolve, you know, I mean, you understand it, essentially at the microchip level, which, you know, like I said, to most of us, just, it seems like magic, right? We don't yeah. understand how it works. <laughs> so like, you can look at it and be like, no, you know, I mean, I actually know how this is going together. And I know that it's not going to wake right. up one day and, and hunt me down. But I feel like to a lot of people, they're like, well, yeah, but what's stopping it from doing that? <laughs> 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 that's right but but you know now when when we are thinking to colonize other planets we know that humans are going to travel there at some point but that would be one sure. way ticket so they're not going to come back and most probably they're not going to survive over there so that mm -hmm. means that we do need to be dependent on other tools and technologies ai robotics and all those which can go there and mine certain minerals for us and mine uh, collect other data. So, of course, at the moment, there are some great robots from NASA. They are working over there. However, they are not just enough. You may be aware that NASA also deployed a small helicopter kind of machine over there. I, I don't know what they call it precisely. Yeah, and, I, I know what you're talking about. Exactly. So, you know, so those machines are working as robots for us on the other planets and the, the other world. However, uh, there is a big need. This, whatever we have achieved so far in robotics, that's not just enough. AI is just a start. Robotics is just a start. A big impact is coming up. It, it, it totally depends how quick we basically adopt those. If we stay afraid of those, I would say it would be a mistake. It would just push individuals as well as businesses maybe 10, 15, 20 years back from the competition. Sure. Do you think that there's, it's an interesting question. Do you think, are there any limitations to what we can do with robotics? 
Is there stuff that robotics will just never be able to do in your mind? Or do you think at some point we'll essentially be able to use robots for absolutely everything? Well, you know, limitation is just the imagination. So, so for example, a computer, even a highly advanced computer cannot solve every problem that we have around us. Sure. So you still need to you still need to overlook certain tasks which you perform with the computer. So similarly, robots will not be able to solve just every problem that we have. However, they can they can automate they can take care of certain tasks which are basically which which take too much of our energy and effort and investments and time. So so I would I would not think I would not say that the robots are going to solve just every problem. So so you know if someone is sick. You still want to give them a human touch to basically sure. take care of them. You don't want to ask a robot to, you know, go and take care of them. However, there are robots being developed for for old homes and for hospitals where they can, especially in a country like Japan, where young people are already not that many, and then they are too busy in in their career, and then their elderly family members they are waiting for someone to, you know, have a song with them, have have a story with them. So, uh, but still, uh, humans are. Uh, we 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 are still we need to be around. We 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 still uh, we we still need to be taking care of a lot of those tasks which we need. We a lot of those jobs which we need to get done every day. Robots are just going to augment us. They are just going to help us. And as your original question, whether they're going to have a lot of applications, yes, for sure they would be. However, we can't think that they would be just solving every problem. They mm-hmm. would be just basically streamlining some of our work so that we just be more creative on the other side. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I, you know what, I think about it from this standpoint too, right? Like, you know, whether you want to call it a robot or you want to call it a tool, technology yeah. has always made things easier for people. And yeah, in some cases, it's replaced jobs. But in a lot of cases, you know, those people, they, they did something else. or there was another job opportunity. I don't necessarily think that robots are going to show up and take all these jobs. I think it's going to allow people time to do things that are more productive. Like you said, you don't need people to mop the floor. That person could be the next computer scientist doing something right. great. Exactly. So once once you treat and teach those those people, even your existing employees who are basically busy in their manual work and repetitive work, those guys are their wonders. They can do a lot actually. And yeah, no, they're not going to take jobs away. It is luckily we are at a time where we have two great examples. One is the analogy of computers when we were afraid of, as I already talked about, when we were afraid of computers many years back, and now we can see that we can't live without a, a computer on our arm. You know, we have those small watches right yeah. on our arm. That's right. The other example is Amazon. Amazon is probably the biggest marketer for robotics. Amazon has already deployed hundreds of thousands of robots in their workplaces. And they made their workplaces safer. They they made them more enjoyable for their employees. And so so similarly, it's not that jobs are going to be taken away. It is just that it's just going to reshape the workplaces. Robots are going to make workplaces safer. Employees are going to enjoy them more instead of you know they getting they getting really bored and and unpleased with the, with with their boss boss asking hey can you move these boxes to the other side of the building sure. just because we we don't have a forklifter today working or we don't have a, a, a certain person who didn't show up so so I would say this is what our philosophy at Aero is that we should make a machine which should really make we should solve a real problem and make people happier than what they are now. So with Arrow, are you are you building these robots in Edmonton? I know you guys are based in Edmonton. Are these robots actually manufactured right oh, here? Yeah. Yes, definitely. So we bring all bits and pieces, screws, tiny screws, pieces of aluminum. Wow. We 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 design the robots, we we manufacture them, we test them, assemble them, market them, sell sell them right from Edmonton. So the, the philosophy was basically so that we are not so much dependent on someone else's constraints and vision. So, for example, if we need to introduce a certain feature in a robot, we are not dependent on a supplier in another country if, if they have enough capabilities and, and knowledge and skill set and whether they can do it for us or not. So me, as a leader of the team, I developed a, a certain culture over here that, yes, we, we don't need to reinvent everything. It's, just, it's, uh, it's great if we can find certain parts. However, uh, uh, no one should limit us from from putting our own vision and creativity into these robots. Well, and this is where we found it really amazing that it's working very well. Yeah, and and I just love that you're building them in Edmonton. <laughs> right? like, <laughs> yeah. I love you yeah. know I'm a huge supporter of things made in Canada, and and especially yeah. when people think of robots, Fahim, they are not thinking of robots built in Canada. Not only robots yeah. not built in Canada, but they are literally building them in my backyard. They're building them in Edmonton. <laughs> yeah, and, that's true. Um, 
It's impressive. And yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit because you talked about this in the beginning when you were talking about that robot that the hospital had bought for what is 150 grand or something for one robot. Yeah. You're doing it for considerably less, aren't you? Yes. Yes. So can I, if I just give you an example, so currently when people, when, when businesses need to buy, like if you just think of five different tasks, they need to buy literally five different robots from five different companies. And then they need to go through a huge level of budget plus their maintenance, plus their regular updates. And then they need to have experts on those robots who can maintain those. So, you know, the level of complication goes to a level where you talked about that people are reluctant to adopt these. Sure. However, what we can do is that we can just at a tenth of the cost, we can really provide much more effective and better technology to SMEs, to small and medium enterprises. And so so now what they need to do is they just buy one platform, which is AI-based, which is autonomous, which thinks, which sees, which which makes its own decision when, when it is supposed to perform its task. It's mobile. And then people need to just put attachments. We call those attachments or modules. So they just yeah. come, for example, if our robot is delivering your boxes throughout your facility during the daytime, the same robot can be transformed into a way that it would start cleaning your floor for the night hours. Now that transformation, you don't need a PhD for that. Literally, you just need to bring another attachment and clamp on the robot, and then it would, you just tell our software, we, we put a lot of effort on our interface, the, the human robot interface. We call it a, the commander app. So uh, someone will just have to go and then click a button, hey, now you are not a, a parts runner, a box runner. Now you are a scrubber, actually. Yeah. Now you just adopt that functionality. Now you think yourself as a cleaner. So the robot will literally load that specific routine or program, and then it will start cleaning your floor. And once it is done, then you can change the same same robot to start disinfecting your surfaces through spraying chemicals or through turning on UV lights or through other means. Yeah, it, it's... So. And, and and we're not talking about, so, you know, I mean, I got people listening right now. They're not really sure quite what we're talking about. We are actually talking about a fairly good sized robot. This thing is yeah. not small. I think in your demonstration videos, it's carrying three fifty gallon drums, isn't it? Exactly. So our existing model called Aero S, it is dated to about 120 kilograms. It says uh, its own weight is about 80 kilograms. So it's a fairly a good sized robot. It's, we call it a small size because we do have a plan to bring a medium as well as a Interesting. larger model. Interesting, okay. And um, so this model can easily fit uh, in a small SUV. Literally, we have been just driving around in Alberta so um, with, this, uh, with this specific model. And whenever we need to demo to a certain client to, to, give them a, to get them started a trial, they can literally, we just, just put an SUV and then drive to them. So it's, just, uh, it's so compact. Yeah, it, so it is compact, hundred percent. I'm just trying. To, I'm trying to give a description of it in a way that someone listening can understand the size. <laughs> right? right? It, it's big enough, people, that you could sit on this thing comfortably yeah. and still it's not so take big. up the whole thing, and it'll right. rip you around, no problem. <laughs> it's it's an impressive yeah. robot. And you were you said one tenth the cost of that other one you're yeah. talking about. So are we talking like around fifteen thousand dollars for an outfitted well, robot? Well, generally when people need to buy multiple robots, the cost their budget can easily go over four hundred fifty oh, half a million, four hundred fifty thousand dollars to half a million easily. So when you have to add a lot of add-ons from various companies, and when you're when you're talking about various modules or, or uh, plugins, so in our case it's literally around fifty thousand dollars, and you can have a, a versatile solution in your facility. Okay. Uh, augmenting your workforce and you're dealing with one company you're dealing with one team you're literally dealing with one technician who, who needs to come to your place in case if there's a need otherwise our platforms are so well designed that we can just provide software updates over the air and then they can just keep running throughout the facility yeah that's amazing right like fifty thousand dollars that's that's the cost of your janitor right like it's not yeah, exactly. it's not so, a crazy cost and then the, the, the cost, not just a janitor, but the cost of uncertainty over there. So whether the task will be done or not. So how many times you can ask a janitor to, to get a floor done uh, sure. carefully. For example, if I give you an example of uh, food distributors, they need to clean their floor two to three times every day as part of uh, the whole process. General warehouses, they need to clean their floors probably every two or three days, second or third day, because there's so much coming in. There's so much moving out. Manufacturers, a lot of activities are happening. They have not just cleaning, but they need to move parts. They need to basically scan their equipment for, for, for various different signatures coming from for various different indications. So all of those tasks can be automated through our robots. 
Yeah, <laughs> I I love your robots, by the way. I just think <laughs> I think they're so well designed. They look so cool. We'll definitely exactly. give people the link to your website after this, because I think everyone on the show is going to want to see what they look like, because they are impressive. Definitely. But I do want to chat a little bit about about the AI specifically in the robot. So like, who what are the applications? Who is buying these robots from you? What are the different industries? I know you just touched on food, food sanitation, sure. uh, or food manufacturing center sanitation. What would be some of the other industries and companies? What are some other applications that would be really great for aero robotics? Yeah, I'll start with warehouses manufacture. They are right on the top list because they have so much to automate the hospitals. Hospitals acquired this hospitals acquired infections. They are, that's a serious thing when when your your walls your floors are not clean and someone goes with goes there with a the sickness they do acquire even they get more sicker actually so then government buildings any kind of large building image uh, airport uh, airports are really an ideal place for us so there are the way I generalize it that any big building which exists there has to be certain tasks which are happening manually and they're happening continuously every day so and then they need basic robots. They need AI-based robots mainly so that they do not need to supervise them. They can just really, really rely totally on the on the intelligence which we have already put into into the machine. And so, but I can I can give you literally a lot of examples of, of various facilities which exist at larger scale, actually, even shopping malls. Yeah, in shopping malls things need to move around from one end of a big building to another end, actually. So. I would say that the, the 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 applications are just limited by our imagination. So, for example, when I talk to my team, I ask them that how our number of attachments we're going to develop, how our number of tasks we're going to cover, that is totally dependent on how well we think the work can be automated. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I think a lot of people struggle to think of how they would even utilize a robot because right. i think it's like it's like if if it was just your imagination you say hey robot yeah you over there we need you over there to pick up that item and go put it over there it's a right. whole nother thing to program that how yes. do you guys handle that situation yeah so at the moment we are helping our clients to program certain routines for example when we put an attachment with a manipulator then it has got a robotic arm on it so that arm can load our thermal camera and our air camera which can identify objects so for example if we need to program that arm then we can provide a piece of software to our clients those the, they can basically use those to to program the arm however if we just if we just need to run the the, the, the base platform which we call basically a flatbed which is an autonomous ai based platform then literally we have already taken care of the programming so the clients do not need to do any kind of technical learning even my kid who is 10 years she can come to our facility and she can program a robot because wow. if, if you can operate a touch screen based device yeah. like a tablet you can literally operate our robot it's so easy That's so, it. so it does not it, it does not need any kind of technical knowledge you literally need to know what you need to get done yeah and then you can program it with that so we have put huge amount of effort in, in, in smoothing the process of adopting certain technology for example and as an upfront thing you can see that when people carry over they, they just hold over a tablet and they can see that how well they can program the robot how easily they can do it so so it's so easy yeah and of okay. course there are, there are certain attachments there would be there would be a need of a certain level of program sure yeah it's like the more complex the task there's definitely going to be a little bit of expert yes. programming involved however definitely doable and i think yes. like you said if it's just an application of moving things around a warehouse you've set it up so easy that it can just be done right. with programming on a tablet Exactly. And because we are we are a novel company in a way that we are we have a team of creative scientists, researchers, engineers over here, we're gonna improve these things continuously. If if there is if if there's a certain challenge for someone to operate, for example, our robotic arm today, that would not be the case tomorrow actually. Things are improving very quickly. Even as a CEO of the company, I cannot keep up how quickly we can, we are <laughs> sure. progressing on certain tasks actually. As we are continuously updating our user manuals, documentation, our our parts list, which we need to buy, where to buy, because those updates are continuously improving actually. Yeah, no, for sure. You know, it's so funny, Fahim. I think about being a kid. I think about being a kid. And when I was yeah. in high school, our teachers consistently 
Kelly, you got to learn how to do math this way because you're never going to have a calculator in your pocket. It's like, holy crap, now um, we got a supercomputer in my pocket, <laughs> right? Yeah, and yeah. it's, it's going to be the same thing with robotics and AI, right? Like, exactly. you know, I, you could sit here today and be like, yeah, right now that robotic arm is kind of hard. And then, you know, 10 years down the line, someone will be like, be like, what? That was hard? No. <laughs> right? No, so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's where the whole effort comes, where whole the, the marriage of multiple technologies when it comes through and when we make not just a part for someone to buy, but basically we provide a solution for someone to just out of the box solution, actually. So they just press a button and it starts working. And that is where it is our real duty as a technology company to make the solution much easier for someone to adopt. Sure. If, if if there is someone if, if there is enough if there's a lot of learning for them then that means they're going to move away from that anyway yeah i talk about that a lot because you know i i'm an i'm a business development firm so right we talk a lot about about making it easy for your customers right because at the end right. of the day if your customer has to jump through too many hoops to find you or to interact with you or to do something they're just not going to do it right like that's exactly. just the reality you have to make it as easy as humanly possible especially as a bd rep when you're marketing for a business. And it's the same thing, like you said, when you're creating a technology, you need to make it easy so that everyone can use it. Because if not everyone can use it, they're just not yeah. going to. They, they can't get enough value out of that. And they would get, basically, they would start regretting what they got into that specific piece of technology. It's not just robots, but even if they buy a pen, and if the pen is not performing well, you can start thinking that, should I really go for this brand again or not? Sure, sure. So can you what what have been some of the challenges that you faced in getting this company off the ground? You want to tell me a little bit about some of the stuff you've uh, run into? Yeah, well, we started three years back um, as, as, a, as a very ambitious goal to basically to get it done. And there have been a lot of challenges technologically because we just didn't want to go to someone and say that, hey, invest in our company, but we just have the whole vision in our, actually, there's nothing in front of us, I can't prove to you. So so the, initially, the challenge was to talk to small businesses, medium-sized businesses, without having a robot in our hand. Sure. Within a year, we developed first prototype, and then we had something, and then we were just going to people, and they, we were looking, you know, it's a little bit more credible with something that we, what we are talking about there is, they, they yes. still exists, actually. So development of the technology, because it is highly capital intensive. It is. It takes a lot of time. It is not something where you, where you develop an app and then the next day you have 10,000 followers or subscribers. Sure. It takes a really long time, but it has a very long lasting impact as well. And so I would say tech development has been a challenge, but now we are over with that. After three years, we are at the generation three of our robots and now we are already basically deploying them in the field. So we are already over with that whole challenging time period. Yeah. Well, that like, so the, the problem you face really, like from where I sit, the problem you face is that just not enough people know about what you're doing because what you're yeah, doing exactly. is impressive. It's needed, especially in Edmonton. We live in like a manufacturing hub. <laughs> There's warehouses, distribution yeah. centers all over the place that are going to need your robots, right? Your, yeah. your challenge right now is you're just a little bit unknown. The first that I heard of you was at that global 500 event. What right. have been some of the other tactics you've been utilizing to market Aero? Yeah, well, let me just cover this. Why we have been unknown? Because that was a strategy for us to live under the rock. For okay. three years, we just stayed under the rock. We didn't reveal what was there, what was happening, because we just wanted to prove to the to the surroundings, to the society, that yes, we can do it at very minimal resources, and, and just uh, we would prove it. However, what are the other ways we are going to reach? We are literally reaching through face-to-face -face, uh, conversations. You bet. Businesses are always welcoming us. They are, they, they are talking to us. They are bringing their unique problems to us, and then finally, we just provide them a solution. And it is that it is many businesses, as, as soon as they discover us, our LinkedIn, our uh, Google search, our, you know, from our, from our messages, then literally they just contact us. They, and then they, they, they can literally contact me sometimes through LinkedIn, some, mm -hmm. sometimes through sending a message through our website because there's an email provided over there. So they, they just come over to us and then they just, they, they just provide a certain level of intelligence, which we did not know before. And then we learn more and then we provide them a, a more curated solution. But yeah, for marketing, you know, for, as I told you that the biggest marketer for us is Amazon. So after looking at their documentaries, people don't need to think twice that whether they want robotics or not. So, sure, sure. And then they, then they literally search us. Yeah. That, well, that's it, right? Like, it's just, it's a matter of you have an amazing product. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've, I don't work for you. I have no affiliation <laughs> with you. I just see what you're doing. And I'm incredibly right. impressed. And I'm very, very proud that something like this is going on right in my backyard in Edmonton. I'm, I'm very proud of what you guys are doing. and proud of you guys for building such yeah. an amazing product. 
we are going to make Edmontonians really proud. Of, Damn uh, right you are. Yeah. And when I when I talk to my team, I say that we are putting a base, a foundation of something big. It is. So so then it is coming along. However, as you mentioned, sometimes things do get slow because you know development of this kind of uh, complex technology takes time. Sure. But um, now we are at a point where we are we have started delivering the value to the market. Yeah. If you could go back to the beginning, essentially when you were kind of just kicking off with this and you could give yourself a little bit of advice, what might that be? Well, I think, I mean, there are, there is a lot which we could have done better with the, with the, with the technology itself, but unless you take the, take those, all those, uh, those complex routes, you cannot take shortcuts. So, however, I could have said that probably we could have talked to the investors a little bit earlier. And okay. then probably we could have brought some 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 capital into the company, and then we could have sped up the whole development. However, again, I would say that I never wanted to talk to someone without having something in hand and without proving it that yes, me and my team can really do that. And so initially, we were having a lot of hard time. Our employees were not willing to join us just because a lot of uncertainty around that. So we, we were having a lot of challenges. However, even if we if I do it. The second time, probably there would not be much different than, you know, optimizing the whole process, finding suppliers, uh, talking to uh, to the per, to prospective clients a little bit earlier, getting their feedback. But, but I mean, in the last years, we have been very busy with, them, with the industry. We have been visiting them. We have been giving them updates. We have been working with, with companies very closely uh, here in Edmonton, Nisku, Red Deer. So that kept us super busy throughout the time. The reason I like to ask that question, Fahim, is I have a lot of entrepreneurs on the fence listening to this podcast. This podcast really goes out to a lot of people that are in the BD profession and a lot of people that are essentially in the newer entrepreneurial stages. So they either haven't taken the jump yet and they haven't started their business, but it's on their mind, or they are very new and they've just kind of gotten into it. Or heck, maybe they are a little bit established, but I think that there's a lot of great information that someone like you, a serial entrepreneur, can provide to them to give them that little motivation. Because, you know, you remember, you remember starting your first business. It was a hell of a leap. It was scary, right? Like we, (laughs) we, we all get scared. We just do it anyway. Do you have a little bit of advice for somebody who's maybe on the fence about starting their business and they, they're not really sure how to make that jump? Yeah, well, of course you can make a, a direct jump from your daytime job to start something which which is uncertain which does not have any tomorrow which which which, which probably have 99.9% chance to fail and you are just after 0.1% of success however i would say persistence is 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 something which is the key you have to be passionate i mean you can you can arrange some level of investment as well however if someone is not persistent someone is just doing it just as a fun then very soon that hobby it basically fades out and then you you start getting interested into something else your family takes over with your time your you start getting busier with something covid hits you know something yeah. else come up persistence i would say if you are if you don't have that kind of habit i would say that there is a hard chance to fail and that that level of passion that level of staying up late at night and you know getting things done that is super important Absolutely, and you do lose a certain benefits, certain shortcoming, short, short-term benefits, basically. Yes. In the life, for example, not seeing someone on their birthday or not attending someone's wedding ceremony just because you were too busy seeing a client, actually. Yeah. But I would say that ultimately it does pay off, actually. So when when your brainchild is in your hand, you can really feel to be proud of that, and that's a winning moment. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, Fahim. You know, it takes dedication and consistence. But I'll tell you what, if you believe in what you're doing, it doesn't feel hard, does it? You know, you're giving a lot like the reality is between capital business development, me founding and and operating that and me starting this podcast and kind of doing this. My God, yeah, I'm busier than I've ever been. I I, (laughs) I probably work in 15 hour days, most days, it just is what it is. But it doesn't feel that hard. It doesn't feel that way. Because I'm, I love what I'm doing. And I think I see it in you too. You love what you're doing as well. And it doesn't feel like work when you love what you're doing, does it? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't feel you to be having a job, actually. It is your life. So you have to do it. You have to live with this. You can't really get over with this quicker. There is is always a time, you know. You have to go through that level of hurdles, that level of challenges. You can't have shortcuts, you know. So otherwise, if if there's a shortcut, that means you are doing something wrong. You are missing some of the steps to make your, your dream perfect. 
So, uh, of course, there are challenges. There are uh, issues. However, uh, another advice which you can put to people is to just team up with like-minded people. They bring a lot of moral, moral support. They bring, sometimes they join in your venture and sometimes they partner up and then they bring the huge amount of support. Like the co-founder of Aero, Clayton Kutu, he is a great guy. He, he brought a huge level of creativity and contribution to the company to uplift. So, so this kind of uh, partnerships and uh, teaming up that makes a big difference of breaking it or making it. Yeah, absolutely. So can you tell me a little bit about the team at Arrow and, and, and kind of how you guys got together and came up with this idea to begin with? Yeah, so uh, well, we, we started very slow, very, very simple and just two people. And then I failed with certain people. Some some people joined and then they got disappointed or there's not much happening. So let's move on. So So there were challenges in the start. However, as soon as we started, we developed our first platform and then we started showing up then we, we we got really more more ambitious and and, and skillful team members who, who who joined the team and then they started making a big difference so currently we have a team of experts on ai and robotics on electrical side on on software so so you know people want to look at your passion at your persistence and they want to see if 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 the main guy is not there then why should we come in mm-hmm. so why should we take a risk with startups there are big rewards in the long term in the long run there are some sacrifices some hurdles some challenges in the short term but uh, if there is enough for people to see for themselves where they're going to be in their career they join very quickly to a startup yeah, yeah like yeah. so when obviously when when I saw you, I got invited to the to the Global Five Hundred event by Colin Christensen, who's also been on the right. show. By the way, it was an amazing yeah. person to have on, yeah. entrepreneurial expert. It was a it was a great show. I worked with Colin. He's a great guy. Yeah, did he help you guys out at all? Oh yes, yes. Colin has been super critical. How to make my pitch? If I if I if you think that I performed very well in the presentation <laughs> on the pitch, yeah, Colin has a big role into that. Okay, and he he's he's great. He he's very good with design. He he contributed a lot. He was I worked with him for three months, and then you know every day, for continuously for three months, and he he did a great job. Wow. Yeah. Like he, yeah, he was an amazing guest. His story is unbelievable too. It was such a great show. If you guys haven't heard that yeah. show yet, you guys got to go find the, I did actually a two-part interview with Colin Christensen. You guys got to go back and check that out. Cause probably it's you need great. a third part with him. Yeah. <laughs> he's so, you could probably sure. do a fifth part with him, man, sure. with his experience. It's unreal, yeah. but he's such an, you know what it is though. And I see this in a lot of entrepreneurs and Colin is no exception. Optimism, like no tomorrow. Yes. I feel like every entrepreneur I've ever met, has been some of like the happiest go lucky. They're always optimistic. And I just love that about them. But I truly think that that's a critical piece in any entrepreneur. Yes. Well, you know, that gives you energy that 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 keeps you awake at night and still you don't feel sleepy because you uh, you know that tomorrow is going to be better than today. You know that tomorrow you're going to have one more step done. You're going to have one more break put on your building. And so, so optimism is super important. However, if you are in a bad company, then even if you're optimist, then people really degrade you. People think that oh, what you're doing, what, why are you wasting time in this thing? And you do need to be around great people. You do need to find them. And, and they really empower your optimism to a big level. Totally. Totally. And you need, I think too, you need to surround yourself with positive people, right? Yes. Negativity breeds negativity. So yeah. if you're around people that are pessimistic, they're negative, unfortunately, it's going to rub off on you. And the opposite is also true. If you're around people who are happy, optimistic, always looking at the bright side of things, you are yeah. also going to feel that way and, and have that outlook on life. And I feel like when you're doing anything that's, you know, that's ri- as risky, because there's risk, right? And anything, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're starting a business, there's always a risk. And you can't be sitting and dwelling on that risk. You need to be sitting and dwelling on the positives, the upcoming opportunities, because you almost have to, you have to have that mindset in order to, in order to move forward. Exactly. Yeah. So if, 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 if you're not around great people, then as you've mentioned, then they're going to basically discourage you. They're going to give you different directions, which where they have already failed, but they need to keep their honor. They need to keep their position. So they want, they're going to push you more into the position, into the, into the direction where basically they know that you're not going to make it, but they, they want to promote that. So yeah. And it's not hard to find great people. Actually, it's just not hard to find for, for, for entrepreneurs. It's not hard to find great co-founders. You just need to basically, you need, you need to be great yourself so that you can find, you can work with the really impressive people. 
and yeah. I am really surrounded by, by by really great people actually around me. Well, you know, I I look at I look at your story. You know, like you came on this show and you said, "Look, you know, I I was a goat herder, right? <laughs> like, and now you know you're you're a computer scientist. You're building robots. Like, you are how? Like, I I guess my question is, you've you've probably faced some challenge. You've probably faced some adversity, Fahim." How, yeah. what do you do to stay optimistic, to stay excited about the future? How were you able to overcome an adversity like that and become the man you are today? What, what was the, what was the catalyst that, that, that got you there? Yeah. Well, you know, when I think like, for example, when I started my PhD, it was not a, a like a short time degree. It, need, it needed a lot of effort. And then I knew that I need to think long term. When I started my first company, which failed, my, my thought was basically long term, but I, I started feeling that it was not making up. So you need to keep a long term goal. You need to think five years to 10 years where you can make a difference. You need to think how well you can make a difference to the humanity. Because if you're building something, if you're bringing some value to the society, if someone is going to pay you, you need to think how well you can make that, that difference. And you cannot do that really for a short term. You have to, you, you, know, you, can't, you can't do it really in, in, a, in a month or two months or even a year. So, so I would say, I would summarize it in a way that if, if you don't, don't have a short term, if you don't have a long term vision, it's really hard to basically stay optimistic. You can lose your energy very soon because you could not achieve your goals quickly. Yeah, no, 100%, 100%. Yeah, so there you go. There you have it, guys. Have long-term <laughs> goals, you know? Think of the future. Don't think about necessarily what's coming up in a year. Try to think about what's coming up in five years, where you're going to be in 10 years, because it'll definitely help you. And I think, too, by doing that, too, it, it, if you're planning it that way, you're essentially setting up what steps you need to do every year to get there. So you're actually making it more effective for yourself anyway. Definitely. No, that's awesome, Fahim. Do you have any questions for me before we close the show? It's been amazing, but I always like to let my guests pick my brain if they have any questions regarding business no, development. No, it's been a, an, hour and, an hour and 10 minutes. I've been looking at timer and then, you know, it, I did not even feel how quickly the time passed. We can keep talking. <laughs> it we flies. Keep talking 100%. about robots, AI for hours and hours. So I really hope that your listeners, your, your whole audience, your public, they're going to enjoy this whole podcast. And I don't have any particular question, but I would love to be a part of the show another time whenever there's a need, whenever, you know, AI has taken over and when the <laughs> robots are more into the field, I can come back and tell you that, yeah, look at that. That's what I was telling you. Oh, totally, so, totally. Like you said, we could have we could have done a show like this for another hour. No question. Yeah. There's no question. And <laughs> I, I think I would love to have you back in the future and chat about this again. This has been amazing, Fahim. Thank you so much for joining us today. Once again, We've been chatting with Fahim Khan. He's the CEO of Aero Robotic Systems in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. They are building cutting edge robots for industry. And uh, Fahim, if they want to get a hold of you or they want to see what you guys are up to, where can they find you? Well, LinkedIn is one platform. Unfortunately, I've been so busy with, with things that I could not keep up more on social media. However, I plan to be more active on Twitter and LinkedIn. But LinkedIn is definitely a great platform at the moment. My email, FK, that is another way for, for people to reach out. Our website, that's another one. If someone really needs to book a meeting without going through all the initial introduction and conversations, literally go to, and then they will take you to my calendar and book a slot over there. And we, we, we just try to make things simpler and easier for people. And uh, however, at the moment, we are so busy just seeing the clients and prospects that sometimes I, I can't keep up with uh, all the updates on social media, but I love to hear back from people. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I just want to say that what you're doing is impressive. I think your robots are going to change the world. And definitely. they're definitely going to change the world locally. I'll tell you that much. They are impressive. Uh -oh, yeah. Guys, if, you, if you're listening to the show and you love robots and you got a bit of nerd in you and you want to check it out, you definitely got to check out his website. And that was, uh, that was aerosystems.ai, correct? Yes. And Kelly, maybe that's uh, probably, I'm not sure what would be the number of your episode, but I'm going to bring a robot to you and you're going to interview them. <laughs> so you're gonna, you're gonna ask same questions. I'm holding same. you to it. Episode episode 100. I'm gonna bring you back. And by episode 100, I want a robot I can talk to. <laughs> so you're gonna ask them who created you, who is your creator, how you are feeling to be in the world. So you're gonna ask them all these questions. Oh man, that would be that would be something else. If you get to that level, you better call me back because I I want to chat with you again about that. <laughs> and the robot is not gonna make up the answers, so they're gonna be very genuine. They're going to be very brutal. If they're not feeling well in front of you, they're going to tell you. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to have those soft skills, hey? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> all right guys yeah. thank you so much for tuning in today this has been episode 26 if you're enjoying the business development podcast please do head over to our website or on spotify or apple Podcasts. please get follow us and leave us a review we appreciate it we read all of them and until next time we'll catch you on the flip side this has been the business development podcast with kelly kennedy Kelly has 15 years in sales and business development experience within the Alberta oil and gas industry and founded his own business development firm in 2020. His passion and his specialization is in customer relationship generation and business development. The show is brought to you by Capital Business Development, your business development specialists. For more, we invite you to the... See you next time on the Business Development Podcast.